Okay, today we're going to talk about flexural or bending stresses in beams. Now, in the previous lecture, we talked about the strain in the longitudinal direction of the beam. And we call that direction the X direction. We call the strain epsilon X. It was a normal or extensional strain. Well, in order to get the stress, sigma X, an easy way to do that is if it obeys Hooke's law, we can take the strain, which we found to be epsilon X is equal to minus, y over rho, and multiply that by the modulus of elasticity, E. So sigma x then would be equal to minus E times y over rho. Of course, uh, let's write this down. This has to be a linear elastic material. And just to recall a couple terms that we had uh, previously, the rho is the distance from the center of curvature to the neutral axis, also known as the radius of curvature. So when we take our beam, it bends into an arc. And the distance here to the neutral axis is the distance rho. Now the actual surfaces of the beam are above and below this neutral axis. Try to sketch something in there. And then the distance y is the distance upward from the neutral axis, positive upward. You can take on positive or negative values. The biggest positive value we can get is from the neutral axis to the top edge of the beam. The, the biggest negative value we can take is from the neutral axis to the bottom of the beam. Now right now our definition of the neutral axis is the place on the beam that does not have any extensional strain. If it doesn't have any extensional strain, that will also be the place that has no stress. And the maximum magnitudes of stress will be on the upper and lower surfaces of the beam. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail soon. Now we talked about the strain distribution and the stress distribution looks just the same. If we were to look at a side view of the beam, I'm trying to draw this a little bit bigger, where we have the neutral axis that I'm going to dash in here. And put a bending moment on this such that the top is in compression. The stress distributions vary linearly with the distance from the neutral axis. Positive bending moment will put the top in uh, compression and the bottom in tension. Let me get rid of that line right here. Let's see if I can draw kind of a 3D uh, view of this beam. Try to draw it kind of big. And for purposes of sketching this, it's easiest if I draw this as a rectangular cross section. Of course, you can have beams of other shapes. Okay, so on this side, here's our neutral axis. And as we look at it on the end of the beam, that creates what's known as a plane called the neutral surface. I won't sketch it in, but it goes into the depth of the beam and makes this plane. Now on the uh, corners, I can draw some stress arrows. Compression on the top, 
it goes down linearly to that surface and then it connects straight across here and then likewise with tension on the bottom. So this shape of the stress distribution is the shape of a wedge. There's a wedge on the top half and the wedge on the bottom half of this beam. I'll put in a few more arrows so that you kind of get the idea here. But you can kind of see this distribution now. A wedge on the top in compression and a wedge on the bottom in tension. That comes about from a bending moment that goes like this on the beam. And if we want, we can figure out what that bending moment is in terms of the resultant of the stress distributions on the top and bottom half of the beam. Let me switch colors. Let's put a coordinate system on this beam. From our neutral axis, that's going to be our special point. Y is positive upward. X goes down the axis of the beam this way. And then the Z direction is perpendicular to that. And it looks uh, like it come, kind of comes out toward us a little bit on that cross section. So if we want to find the resultant moments, and we'll also find the resultant force, we're going to need to convert this stress distribution into a force. And we did this way back in uh, chapter two, way at the beginning of the semester. How we're going to approach this is we're going to take a look at a small bit of area. I'm going to put it in the positive YZ direction. That's a little bit of area. That's a little rectangle I'm drawing, a little square. And I'm going to say that that has the area A. If I look at this little square over here, on that square is some stress. And notice it's pointing that way on the top. It's going to the left. Okay, so this is my area DA. If I wanted the little bit of force that acts on that little bit of area, since uh, force is equal to stress times area, a little bit of force would be equal to that stress, and we call that sigma X because it's in the X direction, times the area that it's acting on, DA. So that gives us a little bit of force right here. In addition to the force, that also causes a bending moment about the z-axis. Now, if we go upward from the z-axis to that point, that's a y distance. So a little bit of bending moment about the z-axis is going to be equal to the force times the moment arm distance y, which we can write as y times sigma x dA. All right, I just scooted that up just a little bit, made a little bit more room. Now we're going to look at equilibrium. Let me switch back to my red color. So I want to look at the summation of forces in the x direction and the summation of moments about that z axis. So let's do uh, summation of forces. We'll take to the right as positive. And if you remember, a resultant force is the volume of a stress distribution. So what that says is we want to take an area integral over the cross section of the, the beam of sigma x dA. Now, if you notice, there is no net applied force to this object. It's in pure bending. So that has to be equal to zero. 
We'll look at this in more detail later. Another way to say this is if you look at this wedge on the top, it points with the resultant force going to the left. There's a wedge on the bottom that has a resultant force to the right. The volumes of those two wedges are going to be equal. It's pretty easy to see if we have a rectangular cross-section, but if we have linear elastic loading and we keep, take our coordinate system with respect to the neutral axis, that will even be the case for cross-sections like uh, I-beams and T-channels and different shapes like that. All right, now let's also do then uh, the summation of moments about the z-axis. All right, so we're going to take uh, this way about the z-axis as the positive direction. So we have a positive moment, m, that's applied. And then pointing in that direction, we have an integral of y df, which we said we could replace that integral of y df with an area integral, then, of y times sigma x dA. Another way to say this, uh, equal to zero for equilibrium, another way to say this, then, is that this moment is equal to minus this area integral of y sigma x dA. All right, the next thing we'll do is we'll take a look at uh, stress and strain and put that in equilibrium. We know that our stress now from the previous slide is equal to minus uh, E Y over rho. So if we put that into our first equation, we have an area integral of minus E Y over rho dA equal to zero. Let's work with this just a little bit. The E and the minus sign and the radius of curvature for a particular point in the beam are constant. So those can be taken out in front of the integral. And now we're left with an area integral of y dA. If you have a beam that's been bent, the rate of curvature is not going to be infinity, and material properties are not going to be zero. So if we look at this uh, area integral of y dA, that is the first moment of inertia. We called that Q previously. And Q, with regard to the geometrical properties of the cross-section, is equal to y bar times the area. Now, for this equation to be equal to zero, and we know that this isn't infinity and this isn't zero, the area of the cross-section cannot be zero. The only thing that makes this equation work is that y bar has to equal to zero. Okay, e is not equal to zero, a is not equal to zero, and uh, rho is not equal to infinity. Now that's kind of an interesting statement. Now if you remember what that means, our coordinate system starts at the neutral axis. And now we just said that the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid, that's what the y bar is, is equal to zero. Okay, what this means is something that's very going to be very convenient for us. If we have a beam that's under linear elastic loading, the location of the centroid is going to be where the neutral axis is going to be at for our beam. Now we have those assumptions. We have a symmetric cross-section about a vertical axis. We have linear elastic material behavior. But given those things, the neutral axis 
and the centroid of the cross-section are going to be coincident. That's why you did all those homework problems previously about finding the centroid. It's going to be your first step in any kind of beam problem. So locate that centroid, and that's going to be where our coordinate system starts for our stress and strain formulas. All right, that's important enough. Let's go ahead and write that down. So it says, uh, this means that the centroid of the cross-section and the neutral axis are located at the same place with our assumptions of linear elastic materials and the other assumptions that we talked about for bernoulli euler beam theory. All right, so that's what uh, equilibrium is in the x direction. Let's take a look at our equilibrium uh, equation for the summation of moments about the z-axis. We wrote this down uh, previously. M is equal to minus this integral over the cross-sectional area of y sigma x dA. And then we said because of our stress-strain relation, we can have in here a y times sigma x. Sigma x was equal to minus e y over rho times dA. Now the negative signs will cancel, and the E divided by rho can be brought out in front as constants. They're not dependent on the area of the cross-section. And we have left with an area integral of y squared dA. And we have seen this term before as well. The area integral of y squared dA is known as the moment of inertia of the cross-section, or the second moment of area. So I'm going to rewrite this as E over rho times i. And in, in particular, for the bending moment that's oriented this way, it's the moment of inertia with respect to the z-axis. Um, we'll talk about bending about the y-axis a little bit later, but for now, I'm just going to leave it as, as the symbol i. So we have m is equal to ei over rho. This leads us to our next topic that we want to talk about, something called the moment curvature relation. The radius of curvature is 1 over rho, but there's another term called the curvature. That's the Greek letter kappa. And this curvature is defined as 1 over the radius of curvature. So if we want, we can rewrite this equation that we just got as m is equal to ei times the curvature kappa. Now if we look at this, we have a load on the left side, and we have uh, e and i over here, and it's a deformation term. This kappa can be thought of as a deformation term over here. And in a way, it sort of looks like our spring equation, f is equal to kx, where we have a load, some coefficient, and some deformation term here. Well, in fact, the product of the material stiffness and the moment of inertia of the cross-section is known as the bending stiffness of a beam. So we have the material stiffness, and then we have the cross-sectional stiffness. You multiply them together, and then you get the bending stiffness for the beam. Uh, kind of interesting story. Uh, it, it, uh, a few years ago, I was approached by somebody that wanted to redesign trailers that they had been making out of steel and make them out of aluminum. So... So we had the steel trailer, and you know, basically you have uh, I beams or box channels or whatever sections you have for for a cross section. But I know that the modulus of elasticity of steel is around 30 million psi. Now, if you wanted to make them out of aluminum, I also know that the modulus of elasticity of aluminum is 10 million psi. So this ratio steel to aluminum 
is equal to 3. Now, if he wanted to change that trailer and make it out of aluminum instead of steel, he has to account for this factor of 3 difference in this these moduli of elasticity. In other words, to get the same bending stiffness when converting the material from steel to aluminum, he's going to have to increase his moment of inertia by a factor of 3. The sections are going to have to be a little bit taller, uh, but not a whole lot taller because the moment of inertia, as we, we know, depends on that uh, distance cubed in the moment of inertia calculation. So that was uh, kind of a, a, a quick thing I could tell them without uh, much effort. Now there's other things you need to consider if you were to, to design an aluminum trailer, fatigue life, and, and some other factors. Uh, but for the main structural design, it's as simple as that. All right, so let's go back and take a look at stresses again. We said at the beginning that stress sigma x is equal to minus e times y over rho. And now we also know that uh, the mo for the moment curvature relationship, m is equal to ei divided by rho. All right. Now, we can use this formula for stress, but it's not very convenient. And the reason why is it's very difficult to calculate or to estimate what the radius of curvature is at a particular place on a beam. If it bends into a circular arc, uh, very easy. But a lot of beams have much more complicated loadings. They're bending up and down and so forth. And so uh, the actual beam, and I'll exaggerate this a lot, now, it might go up and have a different radius of curvature in different spots. It could be a function of position x. But what we can do is we can eliminate the radius of curvature from the sigma x equation by the moment curvature relation. Using this equation, 1 over the radius of curvature is equal to m divided by ei. So that means sigma x is going to be equal to minus E times Y times M over EI. Of course, the moduli of elasticity cancel out from the top and the bottom. And we're left with this formula, sigma x is equal to minus M Y over I. That's going to be a really important formula for us. You will definitely use that on your exam. So let's talk a little bit about it, and then we'll go through an example. All right, so sigma x is the bending stress. M is the bending moment at a particular place along the length of the beam. Bending moment. And that generally depends on position x. Where you would get that from would be a free body diagram or your moment diagram. y is the same y we've been talking about so far. Distance uh, from the centroid now or the neutral axis, they're the same place. Distance from the centroid, positive up. And I is the moment of inertia. Of the cross-section through the centroid.
course, we have a negative sign in there for now. All right, let me get set up for an example, and uh, we'll go through that. Okay, so we're going to apply our formula, sigma is equal to minus my over i. And we're actually going to see that there's two ways to apply this formula. One is if you keep track of the sign of everything very carefully and put that into that equation. And the other is if we compute the magnitude of the stress and look at a free body diagram to determine the sign of the stress. And the sign of the stress is still important. So for this example, we're going to have a cantilevered beam with a constant bending moment applied to it. We'll keep the statics kind of simple. We have 15 kilonewton meters for the bending moment, and the cross-section of the beam is a uh, hollowed-out square. So it's a tube. And across the top, the dimensions 20, 40, and 20 millimeters, and, and down along the side, 20, 80, and 20 millimeters. So sigma is equal to minus my over i. First thing we need to do is we need to find the centroid of the cross-section. Now, in this particular case, the centroid of the cross-section is pretty easy to find. Uh, we won't uh, bog ourselves down with, with doing that. We've found the centroid for other shapes already. And for complicated beam cross-sections, you're going to have to go through that procedure where you find the centroid. But here we know where the centroid is. If it's um, 120 tall, then we know that this is 60 millimeters from the base. And if this is 40, 60, 80 millimeters across, we know that it's 40 millimeters over this way. We need to find the moment of inertia about a horizontal line that goes through the centroid. You may have to use the parallel axis theorem, but in this case, since the uh, hollowed out section and the solid rectangle that sits on top of it, the centroids of all of those are coincident with the centroid of the cross-section. We can simply calculate the moment of inertia of this cross-section by taking 1 12th, the base, times the height cubed of the solid rectangle and subtracting off 1 12th, the base, times the height cubed of the hollowed out rectangle. Now these being in millimeters, we end up with 9.813 times 10 to the minus 6 millimeters to the fourth power. Now if we want to convert that to meters, there's a factor of 1,000 to the fourth power or 10 to the twelfth. So we can pretty easily convert this, uh, excuse me, this is plus 6 can very easily convert this into meters to the fourth power by that factor of 10 to the 12th. And that's where we get the minus 9.813 times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the fourth power. All right, the other thing we need to do is we need to find out the bending moment m. And anywhere that we cut along the length of this beam, the bending moment is constant. Now, ordinarily, you may have to be told to find the bending moment at three feet from the left end or something like that, or two meters, whatever unit system you're working in. But in this case, it, it doesn't matter. By my free body diagram, I know if I have 15 kilonewton meters over on the left side, I'm going to have to have 15 kilonewton meters over on the right side to keep that in equilibrium. Now, if we're keeping track in the sign of everything, we need to pay attention, though, as to whether or not the top is in tension or compression. Remember, our sign convention is that a positive bending moment puts the top of the beam in compression. So, in fact, in this case, the, the value of the bending moment is going to be positive 15 times 10 to the 3 newton meters. Now, we can't find the stresses unless we know where we're going to find the stresses at, so let's pick two spots on this beam cross-section, and uh, we'll take a look at spot A, which is here, and uh, spot B down in this corner. 
We need to find the y distance front to a and b. Now remember, positive y goes upward. So for point A, the distance from the centroid to point A would be 40 millimeters, and that would be positive. And not just point A, but anywhere along this line that goes horizontally would have a Y distance of 40 millimeters. It's going to tell us that the stress in all these spots is the same. Now down on the bottom is uh, point B. Now that goes in the negative direction. And uh, the y distance to point B would be equal to minus 60 millimeters. So now if we wanted to find the bending stress at A, we just use our formula. If we're keeping track of all the signs, we have to include the nine minus sign in the formula. We'll have a plus 15 times 10 to the 3 newton meters. We're going to have a plus... 40 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. We're going to divide that by the I, 9.813, times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the fourth power. If you put those numbers into your calculator and you do the calculation, we end up with a negative sign, 61.1 megapascals. Let's do uh, for the same thing for point B, and then we'll talk about these results. Sigma x for point B, we have a minus sign from the equation. We have a positive bending moment. We are down below, so the neutral axis, so we have 60 times 10 to the minus 3, but that's negative, divided by I, it's 9.813 times 10 to the minus 6. Put all those together, we end up with... 91.7 megapascals. Let's see if these answers make sense. One of the things that we know about bending stress distributions is the farther you go away from the neutral axis, or the centroid, the bigger the stresses are going to get. In magnitude, point B is further away than point A, and it makes sense that it has a bigger stress magnitude. Now, if we look at the way the bending moment is pointing, Anywhere above the neutral axis should be in compression. Point A is above the neutral axis, so we, we do have that in compression, minus 61.1 megapascals. And likewise, you can kind of visualize this. You see how the bending moment pulls out from the bottom and pushes into the top. The arrow pushing in is in compression. The arrow pulling out is putting it in tension. So down on the bottom, it's in tension of 91.7 megapascals. All right, so that's one way to use this formula, just to keep track of the signs of everything. Another way to use this formula is to not worry about the signs until the end. So let's look at this uh, this way. We're going to have sigma x in magnitude is equal to the magnitude of the moment, the magnitude of the y distance, divided by i. So if we apply this approach to point a, we're going to have uh, 15 kilonewton meters times a y distance of 40 meters times 10 to the minus 3 meters divided by i, 9.813 times 10 to the minus 6 meters to the fourth. We get a magnitude of 61.1 megapascals. Now we look at this volume that is a magnitude of 61.1. Now we have to look at where point A is located at. Point A is located up here where it's obviously in compression. So we can indicate that as compression with a C and parentheses out behind it, or we can go back and we put negative sign in front. You don't want to do both because that's like a double negative. Um, but either way, with a negative sign with a compression and uh, indicated out and back. And likewise for point B, we have the magnitude of the moment, we have the magnitude of the distance, and we have the moment of inertia, 9.813 times 10 to the minus 6. Put all those together, you get a magnitude of 91.7 megapascals, and point B is down where it's in tension. 
Uh, so we leave the sign alone. It stays positive. So again, there's two ways to use this. Now, in your homework problems that you're going to get, you'll get uh, maybe a little bit more complicated static situation where you're going to have to figure out where the moment is at a particular point. But that's not any big deal. You draw the free body diagram and you find the internal bending moment. That's going to be your M. You find the moment of inertia of the centroid, uh, of the cross section about its centroid. It's going to be your I. And then you figure out what your Y value is to the point that you're interested in. And if you're interested in maximum values, they're always on the outer edge of the beam. All right, we need to talk about one last thing for this lecture, and that's something called the section modulus for a beam. Now, we kind of alluded to this uh, just a second ago when we said if we wanted to find the maximum stresses in a beam, they're going to occur where the distance from the centroid to the outer edge of the beam is a maximum. And instead of calling that Y max, because Y is a variable, we're going to call that C maximum. Now, the maximum bending stress is also going to occur along the length of the beam where the moment is the maximum. And then we divide that by the modulus of the last, uh, uh, by the moment of inertia, I. Now, for this discussion, let's not look at a rectangular cross-section beam. Let's look at something that's a little bit more sophisticated, maybe a T-shaped cross-section. And uh, maybe the distance from the neutral axis to the top is the distance C1. And the distance from the neutral axis to the bottom is distance C2. So in this case, those values are going to be different. But what I mean by C max is it's going to be the maximum of those two magnitudes. Now, if we look at this the right way, the moment of inertia only has to do with the properties of the cross-section, and so does the C max. We can lump these terms together, the C over I. We can lump that together. And uh, there's a term that's the reciprocal of this, the moment of inertia of the cross-section divided by that maximum C distance is defined as something called S, which is the section modulus. The section modulus is something that we can, doesn't depend on what, what the material looks like, only the shape of the cross section, and we can look that up in a table. It can be tabulated ahead of time based on the shape of the cross section. If we use this term S, then the stress It's going to be equal to the maximum bending moment. Maximum bending moment depends on how the beam is loaded, divided by this section modulus S. Now suppose we know what material we want to use, and we know what kind of loads are on our beam. Those are a couple of things that are pretty typically known ahead of time. And we want to pick out what the beam cross section ought to look like. Well, this can help us. If we take this formula and rearrange it for S, the section modulus value can be determined from the maximum bending moment divided by the maximum stress that you can have in your beam. Now, in design purposes, your maximum stress could be something like a yield strength divided by a safety factor. This is a number that you can compute just based on what the loads and the material properties needed to be for your beam are. So let's write that down. Can be computed uh, from known loading and uh, unknown material, like steel. A36 structural steel has a yield strength of 36 KSI. All right, so for an example, let's just say that we wanted to use an I-beam.
Okay, and we know what the cross section of an I beam looks like. It's basically something like that. And um, we went through and we picked out a material and we found our biggest bending moment. We went through and we found that our uh, calculated design section modulus that we needed was 200 inches cubed. This is a number I'm you know, just making up for purposes of uh, this example. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to go to a beam table and find beams that have a design, that have a section modulus of at least this design section modulus of 200 inches cubed. Let me call up the, the beam table. Okay, so here's an I-beam table. This is a, an Appendix D1 out of your textbook. And uh, the, this table is properties of steel, wide flange, W shapes, uh, W for wide flange, and U.S. customary units. And so up the top, you see the, the picture of the I-beam. And here's the, the nomenclature. T sub F is the thickness of the flange. Capital D is the distance. Uh, and BF is the width of the flange and so forth. Now, if you notice, there's two axes drawn on here, the XX and the YY. The most efficient use of an I-beam is for bending about the XX axis. Uh, sometimes, like in a column application, you may be interested in the YY axis as well. But in this table, we have what are known as a beam designation, and it gives some different geometrical properties. The area, the depth, and then... Over here, for axis XX, it has the section modulus about the x-axis. I don't know how well you can see that, but it says S sub X. And then here's the one for the y-axis, S sub Y. Now let's look at this first one, uh, just to get familiar with this table. The W36 by 230 is the beam cross-section designation. The first number indicates how tall the beam is, and it's approximately 36 inches tall. That's a huge I-beam, three feet tall. Uh, the actual depth is 35.9 inches. We get that from the table right here. Uh, kind of like a two by four isn't really two inches by four inches. A W36 I-beam isn't really 36 inches tall, but it's pretty close. Now, the second number indicates the weight of the beam. In uh, U.S. customary units, the 230 means it weighs 230 pounds per foot. Now, that, if you forget, that's down here in the table. Okay, so it's a very heavy I-beam. It's huge. So one foot of this weighs 230 pounds. So if our S design is 200 inches cubed, any I-beam that has at least 200 inches cubed will work for our application. So let's take a look at our list. Here it says 837, that'll work. Uh, 504, that'll work. If 245 will work. 213 will work. So a lot of these things will work. Now, from a design point of view, you don't want to overdo it. You've already taken into account a safety factor into your stress, your maximum stress. And so we don't need to build in lots of extra safety. If we do that, we're going to waste a lot of material. It costs The extra material costs a lot of money. But if you have to move around a W36 by 230 I-beam that's 20, 30 feet long, that's going to be a huge cost in just handling that material. Uh, so all other things being equal, we want to choose the lightest I-beam that will work for our application. So let's write that down. Like I said, all other things being equal, sometimes you have to have a particular depth, uh, maybe for, for a flooring system or something. Let's look through here and see uh, some possibilities. Now, we said the 213 here would work, and that's a W27 by 84. Okay. Uh, here's a W24 by 94. 
Uh, and it's got 222, but it weighs 94 pounds per foot. So I think, um, let's see, let's check another one. This one will work, 227, but it's W21 by 101. And uh, as we go down this way, here's a W14 by 176. So that's 176 pounds per foot. So that won't work. Uh, here's the W12 by 152. That's 209. So that'll work, but it's heavier than this one. All right. So from all the possibilities in that table, this one looks like it's the best one, W27 by 84. Let's just write down a couple of other ones that are close. Uh, the W30 by 90 has um, 245 pounds per foot. That will not work for us. W21 by 101 has um, 227. It works for the S, but it's too heavy. So in this case, uh, this would be the, the one that we would choose since it's the lightest that still meets that designation. All right, give those homework problems a try. You get a couple where you just work with sigma is equal to my over i. I think you get at least one here that uh, where we deal with the design section modulus.